Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to yet another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Today, it's going to be super cool. You're going to learn about things such as great food, uh, building a business in a market that's super saturated and kicking ass. You're going to learn about what the frick is Detroit style pizza? You're going to learn about that in case you didn't know and why it comes in a square pan and why the crust is as it is. We're going to hear from our friend Giles Flanagan, which I'm not only a friend, but I'm also a customer. I've got my blue pan shirt on. What's happening, man? Hey, man, how you doing? Thanks for having me on today. Of course. You've done this stuff before, I think, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Talk to audiences, both live and virtual. Um <clears throat> Uh, in, in many different formats, yeah. You, uh, I met you, geez, probably 20 years ago through family. You used to work in the development field in Chicagoland, property development, right? Yep, yep. And that's how I met uh, your brother-in-law, Dan Orlikoff. And yeah, that's mm -hmm. how we all connected. And you came, though, from Michigan. Yes, you're sir. Not a, Born and raised. not a Chicago boy. You're from Michigan. Okay. I'm a Michigan boy and a diehard Red Wings fan. Where are you from in Michigan? A suburb of Detroit called uh, Troy, Michigan, about oh, 40 sure, Troy. minutes north of Detroit. Sure, I know where that is. So that's a place to grow up. Kind of the point of it's why you don't have a Chicago style pizzeria. It's why you got a Detroit style pizzeria. Yes, sir. The, yes, sir. Your, your blue pan pizza. Now, I've done some research, and for you listeners, pizza's funny, right? Pizza's like uh, hot dogs or coffee like where people like like it a certain way and if it's not the way they like it they hate it like we'll talk a little bit about what detroit style pizza is before we even talk about like the business side of things just so people know well i, I think your i think your description is very relevant because when it comes to pizza i think when it comes to most regional foods mm. um people are very very passionate about it number one yeah 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 and you know they get a little defensive you don't put freaking mustard on a hot dog or ketchup or it, exactly exactly right and you know detroit doesn't have a pizza style what the fuck you know who made that shit up like people think it's just kind of this made up thing right um and it's not it's a it's been around for decades um, it was, it was originally, uh, it was created back in the forties by a gentleman named Gus Guerrera and Mr. Guerrera was an immigrant, right? <clears throat> an immigrant from, uh, Sicily and he was in the Detroit metro area, immigrated with his family and he was trying to make what's called a Sicilian style pizza. Um, so if you know about Sicilian style, it's square. Okay, but it, it has a crust, right? It has an edge, a, it has a crust edge, a cornice, a cornice is what we call it, corniche, right? Corniche. Uh, so, yeah, like corniche. The part, so like the part around like a regular, I shouldn't say regular, but a pizza that most people see, a circular pizza, the crust on the edge, you guys, corniche. Yep, yep, that's okay. the cornice, the corniche, um, and that's a very, very relevant part of analyzing what a good pizza is and i can talk about that in a minute so um, like, like wait 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 real quick like like the company that advertises on tv with the cheese inside the corniche is that like um is that something actually, you're trying to emulate out there the the I'm, I'm joking too what is it like dominoes or one of those yeah like <laughs> the stuffed crust stuff yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we actually um at my business partner's restaurant in telluride he does have a stuffed crust special that he runs that's very very popular especially really? with the midwesterners yeah okay yeah but we don't do uh, that i was trying to, i was trying to make a joke <laughs> but yeah no that, that's a very relevant part of when you're evaluating the quality of any round pizza um is how the rise how the crumb looks inside when you cut that pizza when you look through it the crumb and the webbing very very dense webbing very very dense crumb generally means a lower quality pizza what is crumb not, um crumb is just what we this is just how so if you cut a round pizza and you look through it you'll see like spider webs we call it the crumb okay we call it the okay. crumb and so it's not like a physical crumb you know but looking through a normal pizza you know through its structure um it's called the crumb and the more webbing you have the better quality of dough you have the more webbing you have means the more fermentation that's most likely taken place 
Usually those people have used a secondary dough called a starter that adds a ton of flavor and a ton of, um, a ton of texture to a high quality pizza. Um, so when Gus came over, he wanted to bring, you know, his pizza from Sicily, right? And it's generally made in a sheet pan. So a very shallow sheet pan and sauce on a Sicilian pizza usually goes on top. Right. And you'll hear that a lot about Detroit style pizza. You hear it's called the upside down pizza or the red top pizza. Hmm. Um, so Gus, he got what's called a blue steel pan. OK, now these pans were used in the automotive industry. And what people used to do back in the 40s, they they'd put a bunch of parts in these pans and they would go into a flame, a very high temperature oven. Right. And that oven would sanitize these car, these parts for reuse. OK, now I, can't, I don't know if it's a car part or a part from a machine. I think it's the latter. But it was a sanitization process. And these pans are made out of what's called blue steel. They were square and they could uh, tolerate incredibly high heat, incredibly high heat. So story goes, he brought home one of these pans and he made a Sicilian pizza and what he did was instead of leaving the cheese short, right? Like a normal Sicilian pizza and having your perimeter crust, he put the cheese all the way to the edges of that pan, okay? No cornice. None, right? And again, these pans could withstand really, really high heat. And he baked it at a really high temperature. You know, your normal pizzas are probably in the five, well, mine, Minus wood style, uh, wood burning pizza, um, probably in the 550 range. We cook okay. our Detroit style at 650, right? And this cheese caramelized, and he had this, you know, this new version of Sicilian pizza, right? And he also used a cheese from Wisconsin <clears throat> called uh, brick cheese. And what's really funny, Mickey, is people will ask me, oh, brick cheese? Well, what kind of cheese is it? It's brick. It's called Wisconsin brick cheese. Sure, Very I high fat content. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Very high fat content. More creamy than a whole milk mozzarella. Okay. Right? And he put, this, he put the sauce on top, just like a Sicilian, blah, blah, blah. And it was a big hit. And he started what's called Buddy's Pizza. Buddy's Pizza was the original Detroit-style pizzeria, along with another pizzeria called Cloverleaf. Hmm. Um, you can get this all online, but I believe Gus and his partner had a falling out, so Gus started Cl Cloverleaf. So those were the those are the two OGs, so, and they still so exist today. When you were a kid, you would eat this stuff all the time. But when yeah. I was a kid, it was square pizza. We never called it Detroit style. It was just square pizza. Just square pizza, man. And it's funny, uh, like here in Chicago, people come to visit and from out of state buddies or people and they're like hey let's get some of your chicago style pizza and i'm like well what is that because that could be like 11 different things you know like so and, and it's just like what we were talking about oh no you're not going to uno's you're going to giordano's you're not going to giordano's you're going to it's like uh and they're not at all the same pizza but right. they're all <laughs> chicago deep dish right 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 um you know, and that's part of the fun is none of us pizza, pizza iolos, none of us pizza owners, we don't all do the same style of pizza. We, a lot of us have little different tweaks, little different variations, um, some good, some maybe not so good. So, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of really good pizzerias out there that are doing a really, really good job, uh, in particular in the Detroit style space and working really hard at it. So you moved out to Denver, what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago? 12 years ago, 12 okay. years ago. So like you said, I, I moved to Chicago after college. Um, you know, uh, I, my parents said I was on my own. They gave me, they gave me $300 a month for six months. That was my graduation present. Right. Cause you know, all my, all my friends are going to Europe and getting cars and shit and backpacking for six weeks. Right. I'll never forget when I graduated college, my dad, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to get some kind of present, right? Something, you know, big time because I graduated college. <clears throat> and I'll never forget my mom and my dad said, present? Your present <laughs> is, that we pay, is that we paid for it. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get rewarded for doing your job. You know, you're not going to get you're rewarded. Supposed to do. Right, right, right. And that, I mean, that resonates with me to this day, right? 
And so when I moved there, I was sleeping on my friend's floor. My parents said, look, we'll give you a little help here, but then you're done. Um, so, you know, I moved out after six months. I got my own studio on LaSalle. I slept on, I couldn't buy a mattress. I slept on the floor for about four more months. Never told my parents because I just, just I, I just couldn't tell them, um, you know, and started my career in real estate. And I ended up working with one of my best childhood friends. Uh, he got me into the business. I literally started, I, I, my job was threefold. I was a development coordinator. So a lot of times during the day, I sat in a stool and faxed paper, literally, and then stapled the, the confirmation and filed it. That's what I did. And then a lot, and then I also met with all of our customers and did what's called a punch list. So when you build somebody's home or you build a kitchen, at the very end, you go through, you create a punch list. Um, and, you know, I was filling out paper, man, and developing relationships and also understanding how important customers are to any business by interacting with them one on one. Um, in this case, most of them, it was their largest purchase ever. They were buying their first or second home. Very emotional process. Then I got more and more in construction and I learned more about construction and how things were built. And um, long story short, my childhood friend and I went on to another company at the time was called Peak Development, uh, Peak Property. It was a subsidiary of Peak Properties. They're still uh, in the Chicagoland area, very well recognized, huge property management company. And that's where my career in real estate really started to take off. I was made a minority partner and I essentially ran our construction division. Um, so I had no formal training in construction. I didn't go to school for construction. I went to school for finance and mathematics and, you know, really cut my teeth on learning, you know, learning on the job for lack of a better term. And also learned a lot from the great people around me, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, you, you get humbled pretty quickly when you work with great people who know a lot more than you and you learn how to shut up quickly and listen. <laughs> and um, if, you, if you don't, you, you stupid. Yeah. 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 And I had to learn that. You know, I mean, you know, you're, you know, sometimes, at least for me, when I was younger, you know, you might get a little cocky, a little, you know, your chin's up a little too high. And sometimes it takes somebody that you respect a lot to kind of call you out on that, um, mm -hmm. you know, and say, hey, you know, chill out, reset, you got a lot to learn, kid. <clears throat> and I was really fortunate. I had great people. I was working for really, really great people who understood all this. Um, we had some great, some, some great success. We grew very quickly. Um, we did that everything was, in that house. That was boom time too. Then that was boom time in Chicago, man. That was boom time, man. And we did everything in house. So we did our own construction, our own development, and our own property management. So and most developers they'll just do development, right? And then they, they outsource those other two components of of the stool. We did it all, um, you know. And that's a lot of work, right? That's a lot of work. Is there's also a lot of accountability there, Mick? Because when I'm building your house. My company's building it for you, right? I'm going to make damn sure we don't, you know, um, I'm not going to another contractor to Flanagan Construction and saying, these guys messed it up. I'm going after them or whatever it is. Um, a lot of accountability there in, in what I would call the business chain. And then in the property management, and we would take care of them after they moved in. We did condominium buildings. Those buildings need management companies. So we had this continual relationship, right? Mm -hmm. From the birth of the construction to move in. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I worked with, like I said, I worked with my childhood friend. We started our first lawn mowing business when we were around uh, 11, 11 or 12. Um, we had about six accounts. We'd drag our lawnmowers and weed whips to them once a week in the summer. And then my childhood friend and I, um, starting freshman year of high school, we worked together for a landscaping company. So uh, when I was a freshman, I was working 40 hours a week. My dad would drive me to the yard at seven in the morning on his way to work and pick me up around four. And I mowed lawns all day and pulled weeds. So a very long standing relationship with this friend of mine. Um, been through a lot. Um, Those are and, good memories. I did all that kind of stuff as a young man. You learn so much, especially um, not even like the stuff about like hard work and showing up on time, like not that stuff, but even the things like a relationship or or um not fully appreciating how much or how quickly you can up a relationship that took you a bunch of time and energy to develop like with a, even if it's somebody that's paying you 20 bucks a week to cut their grass that to a kid is a lot and then you you screw something up and or damage something and it can ruin everything it can ruin everything in a blink um mm -hmm. 
I'm glad you said that. So um, one of my mentors in Chicago, uh, he's still alive. He's a gentleman named Ron Frain, and incredibly successful industrial developer in Chicago land. Um, started from scratch, built his business, um, and just a very humble, hardworking, great guy. And um, I did this tiny little project for him, right? So uh, I got referred to him by a really big developer. And I essentially, I built a deck for him. They had a condominium on the second story off the kitchen, like your townhomes in Chicago, there was a deck. So I built a deck and a pergola. And at this time in my career, this is like, you know, kind of not a pain, but kind of a pain, right? We're building all these homes. I have all these, you know, all, I'm running all this construction. I'm doing a deck. This um, little, it was like two, it was just like a annoying little project. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, but I knew who Ron was, number one. Number two, the person that referred him um, was a, a, a partner at a company called Belgravia Group, which is still one of the largest developers in Chicago. And when they refer you, you don't, you don't say no, and you sure as hell don't screw it up. And I'll, and I'll never forget, I was standing in his front yard at the end of the project, and we were talking about development. And I'll never forget him. You know, I was talking about a customer that was giving me a hard time. And he said, Giles doesn't matter if it's your fault or not. You hired the painter, okay? It's on you, right? Fix it and suck it up. And he said, it'll take you years to build your reputation in one day to, to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds so cliche, but I think cliches are cliches for a reason. Because true. most of them are true. Mm -hmm. And to, I mean, I was like 26, 27 years old. You know, I'm 45 now. And I still use that line with my staff and other people, um, the relationship part, Mickey. It's so important to do the right thing, suck it up, because in a blink of an eye, you can burn a bridge and it mm -hmm. can hurt you. Yeah, the restaurant you know? business, which you know far better than I. I've got one of my close friends and mentor and uh, one of my coaches, Dan Hart. He owns a bunch of restaurants here. He, um, It's fun to like look at the crazy shit people will comment online uh, about, or um, maybe they like write an email to the company. They sell burgers, beers, you know, things like that. And you could tell by looking at some of the stuff, this person's got a bad attitude or this person's just an asshole in life, but they go out of their way to write stuff. But some of the stuff it's like, like almost, um, out of control sometimes like the things that people nitpick on and it but if you start to dig into it and i'm not really talking to you but just everybody listening you see every little detail does matter and you can lose your mind trying to make everybody happy that's not what i'm saying but um it's something very simple and in what maybe seems meaningless can have a huge impact on longevity or on uh like a relationship like that that's huge huge right so your um, painter so your painter screwed something up and it and <clears throat> i paid for it yeah Man, right you know Head. those are those are tough pills to swallow sometimes when you're young and, and you know you're learning how to be a businessman mm -hmm. um and, and those in that industry in particular when you make a mistake it usually costs a lot of money yeah. right i can't just make you another pizza if i burnt it right it's usually a construction related issue and some you have to find somebody else to fix that mistake i'm not a painter right um but you know that gentleman had a huge impact on my life and then you know that was you nailed it that was boom time right and then the crash came right and i was a partner in this real estate firm some of the stuff i'm going to be talking about i've never talked about publicly with anybody you guys, outside you my guys family listening, he's talking about the crash of 2008 nothing recent we're talking about a long time ago for you youngsters Yep. Yep. The financial crisis. Right. And as a partner in this firm, I guarantee debt, right? You take loans to build things and you personally guarantee them. It's how the world works. Right. Um, I can get all nerdy on you and say, if you put more equity in, then there is no recourse, but that's a, that's a nerdy finance topic. Um, and everything collapsed mm -hmm. and two of our banks failed. Okay. And the federal, so the federal government took them over. And I'll never forget, they called two of our loans, right? Big loans. And we went out, we raised money to recapitalize these projects, right? Um, all We just needed some time, right? Serious stuff, serious economic impact. We just needed time. And I'll never forget- These were forget projects the that were already underway. Yep. So you've got, not, 
so not only do you have your people that are directly involved, but you've got painters and drywallers and concrete guys and all their their people, their suppliers, their families that are also all this big web of people Huge. are all yeah relying on these jobs. Huge. And they respect Project Mick, right? So we built them, build it and they will come. It mm -hmm. wasn't like, you know, you came to me and said, I want a warehouse for carry trainer and I had a tenant lined up and I'm building to your spec. These were all specs. And um the whole economy evaporated. It just did, especially in Chicago in a market that at that particular time was super frothy. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the Fed, the feds came in, right? And they called our loans. And we said, look, we raised a million dollars. We can recapitalize this. We did our pro formas, Mick. We showed them our debt service coverage. We just said, we need two years. This is serious stuff. We need some time to let the economy recover. We're gonna put in more money. And they said, basically said, F and they called our loans. And that was it. You know, and That's, then I remember, re I remember reading, you know, in 09 about Goldman Sachs and all these guys getting these huge bonuses after the bailout, you know, and, you know, they called our loans and, you know, I, I mean, without getting the nitty gritty, I lost my house. I lost everything I'd saved from I didn't know 20. That. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I don't talk about this very much with, you know, publicly because it's hard, but lost my home. Um, I lost all my apartment buildings. Um, you know, and I was basically, you know, almost, I was at 35 years old and getting ready to move in with my parents um, because it was, it, it was, it was tough. So, so you went from life by the balls, owning apartment buildings, of course, owning your own home. You're a part of a prestigious, uh, well-respected business in that industry in Chicagoland, swinging dick, living life. And all of a sudden it's all freaking gone. Yep. Yep. And I think candidly, I did it responsibly, right? You know, I, as a partner, I saved a lot of money in case shit hit the fan, right, Nick? And so these capital calls came and I, I sold that. I mean, I liquidated my retirement accounts. I, you know, I had partners, right? Um, and it wasn't enough at the end of the day. I'll never forget one of them, um, somebody I know who's a really good guy. I remember him saying to me, you know, Giles, you're probably losing everything. You need to go out. And you need to buy a bunch of TVs and put them under your bed. So if you, if you end up having to file for bankruptcy, you can throw your credit card debt in the pool and at least you'll have some shit you can sell. And I just told, I was like, that's fraud, man. I'm like, I'm going out swinging. I'm not going out. I'm not going to buy shit knowing I can't pay it back. Right. Yeah. Um, this is, that's not, my grandpa would come out of the grave and, and, and he would, he, he would kill me. Um, but that's how serious it was, you know, and, uh, you know, it taught me a lot about life, a lot about myself and, um, you know, it was a tough situation to go through and hopefully if there's one person listening to this that takes some comfort that if they're going through a tough scenario financially or personally or mentally, um, that they're definitely not alone, you know, being in business for yourself is a really, really hard shit with a mm -hmm. lot of risk, you know, so sorry, go ahead. No, you. So then my childhood friend and I split. We started our, our own company, right, Mick? And we were renovating buildings and trying to raise money to buy distressed assets. And we brought in a third partner, highly intelligent guy, really smart dude, really good guy. And, and the, 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 and the most interesting thing about partnerships is kind of twofold. Number one, you have to f know what you don't know. If you think you know everything and you're charging in with your chin up and you think you know everything about any business, you're just, you're, you're off the, you're off the radar. Right. Mm -hmm. And second thing, in my opinion, second thing, you have to partner up with people that has, that have skills that you don't have. You have to compliment yourself. Right. Um, and third, you try to hire people that are smarter than you. You know, Steve Jobs actually talked a lot about that. Hire people that are smarter than you if you want to be successful. So we brought in this guy to raise money and blah, blah, blah. And, um, two years goes by and he was the money guy, right? Um, my, my childhood friend and I, we were the, we were the boots on the ground. We raised some money, but he was the big swinger, right? He had, he had the people that would put down big money. And I'll never forget. It was just before Christmas in 2010, we're in an elevator going up to my office and my, my best friend at the time, my childhood friend looked at me and he said, Drew doesn't want to work with you anymore. And he's going to go out on his own. Um, 
if you're a part of this group, uh, he's leaving. And I just sat there, you know, dumbfounded, right? So we have all these, this is at a point in time too, Mick, where, where I have all, we have all these projects in the pipeline that at that point in time, we're going to save, pro, save me financially, right? We had six apartment buildings under, uh, we were building. I mean, things were looking up. And my best friend said, look, I got to do what's best for my family. Uh, I'm going with them. And unfortunately, you're not going to be a part of the group anymore. And that was some pretty hardcore medicine to take, you know, and uh, I got, you know, again, having all this work in the, in the pipeline that we're actively doing, right. That has upside. Yeah. Um, what kind of a mess was that dissolving that relationship? Like from a fi financial business standpoint, was do you guys have like clear cut dissolution agreements and things that get messy or was it pretty easy? Um, no, it was, it got messy because we probably didn't have the right agreements in place. Right. So we had a merger agreement in place where we are in this trial period and it was essentially that over six months by the end of that month, end of that December, we either move forward as a team or we don't. And if we, if we don't, we each take our respective projects with us. Well, the big projects were under that company, not under my company. Right. And it was tough, man. So like, for, so for those six months, right, my partner, and I own Paradigm and the company we formed with our new partner was 3F, right? And so for, so for those six months, my business partner went over to a different off building, was building this new company. So I'm doing all the work, all the construction, everything on my own, right? Um, to keep cash flow coming in, pay our salaries. And I'm, at the, and I'm also turning down jobs right? Because I'm effectively folding my business at the end of the year because we started something new mm -hmm. and we're going to be doing big, pro bigger projects. And so I'm passing, it's like you were coming to me and saying, guys, would you, would you do my kitchen? And I said, no, Mick, I'm sorry. I'm winding down and start a new company. So I had one project in the pipeline and they said, you know, you're out, you're out. Right. And, uh, it was, it was, it was tough. And, you know, um, are you still a, like, go ahead. I got about 12 grand and even that was hard to get, right? There was six figures coming in and it was, it was somewhat, uh, not somewhat presented to me like, Hey, you're lucky you're getting this. You should take it. Are you and that buddy still friends? So yeah. So we actually ended up reconciling about two years ago. Um, oh, so like a decade went by. Yeah. And we talked and stuff, but you know, it wasn't, you know, it this wasn't is the anything. same guy you were cutting grass with as a kid. Yep. One of my best friends in the world. And I, and you know, um, yeah, we reconciled, we both, you know, I was holding on to a lot of anger, obviously, and resentment, and that's not good energy for you. That's not going to make no. you a better person. It's actually going to distract you from doing what you want to do in your life, in my opinion. And it's going to eat up a lot of mental bandwidth. Um, and that negative energy will carry with you throughout your ventures, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, you know, he called me and apologized and we reconciled and we agreed to, you know, the past is the past. And, uh, you know, we're both going to die one day. We don't know when, but nobody's escaped death. And we made a decision, me in particular, that, hey, you know, this friendship is more important than that incident. And uh, that's how I feel today. You know, it's still that's hard good. to talk about, but it's, it's, it, 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 it's good that we were able to reconcile, in my opinion. Yeah, that's awesome. So what took you out to Denver. I mean, it's, it's now become like biggest boom metropolitan area in the country, maybe next to Phoenix or Nashville. I don't know if there's somewhere else, but it's, it's ridiculous. My nephew was born out there 25 years ago and it's a completely different landscape a quarter century later. Oh man. I mean, I've, I've been out here for 12 years and it's just in 12 years. It's just been like, I mean, mm -hmm. insane. Um, so what, you know, this is where it gets hard again. Right. So what brought me out here was I was going to start, there's a, there's a pizzeria in Telluride, Colorado. It's called Brown Dog Pizza. Very, very popular place. Um, very well known. And my current business partner in Blue Pan owns that pizzeria with another guy. <clears throat> and they signed a lease to bring a brown dog to the Denver area. <clears throat> The irony is when I was in Telluride in 2007, okay, hiking with my buddy who owns Brown Dog, I just kind of randomly said to him, I said, look, man, if you ever want to bring this to Denver, call me first. I love the mountains. I want to get out west. 
Um, and what you have going on here, I think, is really special and cool. Um, and he's like, well, why would you want to get into the restaurant business, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, um, I think at that time, maybe part of me had that. I think a lot of the people in the public think that you open up a restaurant and what you do is you go there and you hang out, you drink, you eat, and you go home, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I've known a lot of people, man, that have opened up restaurants. Invite and, your and, friends and, hey, yeah. drinks on everybody. Drinks for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and look, you can do that, right? But that's not well, that's not going to get you to where you need to go. And that's one of many reasons why so many restaurants fail in 36 months. Um, it was just a random comment like that. And he ended up calling me right before I got kicked out of this company. I, again, the irony. And said, hey, we're doing a brown dog in Denver. Do you want to move out? And I said, yeah. Um, so they signed a the lease. I moved out here. Uh, I had no agreement in place. So I wasn't protected for lack of a better term. And I was going to do the general construction because I was a contractor in exchange, get ownership in Brown Dog Denver. And I was, then I would run it. Well, long story short, we signed, they sent a lease on this property in this really nice neighborhood called Wash Park in Denver. Very nice, very high end, very expensive area, very popular area. And they got one little tiny commercial corridor. It's super cool. And about eight neighbors lost their shit and they we have neighborhood groups out here right so neighborhoods that are defined by whatever boundaries are defined by they have what's called registered neighborhood organizations these organizations typically have a lot of influence over their city council member and hmm. therefore city council they can voice their objections to zoning changes and planning changes and all that shit right well to get a liquor license in denver you need neighborhood support okay you need it and I'll never forget, we get a phone call from the head of the Business Neighborhood Association, right? That represents all these businesses on this corridor and quote unquote represents homeowners. And we go into the property release one night, I think it was a Thursday night, introduce ourselves. And he looks us in the eye and he said, look, we are going to do everything we can to stop you. We know you need a liquor license. We know you can't do this without one we are going to do everything we can to make sure you don't get one. <clears throat> so here I'm here like my first month trying to start a new career, broke, sleeping in my buddy's basement. And this gentleman, you know, doesn't even, pardon me, Mick, pardon me, I'm mm -hmm. going to let this little dog out. Guy comes in, tells you we're going to do everything we can to make this not work. Yep. And you're like, yep. why, why, why are you doing this to me? Yep. Yeah, did you say you that? Know? Did you say why? Why would you? Why are you doing this? Yeah, we just said we don't understand what's going on here. We're bringing a family style pizzeria to a family neighborhood that candidly doesn't have anything like it. We will be a compliment to the neighborhood, not a hindrance. Okay. And he said, we just, we, you know, your pizzeria and tell your eyes a sports bar. Um, you're going to be getting people drunk and you're going to create noise and trash. And their big thing was parking. You're going to bring all these cars and there's nowhere to park. We got big parking problems here. And so, you know, his whole goal and their whole goal was we would have a negative impact on the neighborhood. We're going to bring mm -hmm. this rowdy concept and disturb our neighbors because, you know, there's homes right next to this property. Couldn't be farther from the truth, man. I mean, that's just not what we do. That's not how I live. Okay. So... We call him, and his parting words to us were, were, was, get ready for the fight of your life. And I'm just Whoa. like, gee, I mean, so yeah, so I mean, I'm, you know, I'm scared, <laughs> That's right? That's funny, man. That's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just funny how, I mean, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about, people commenting online about, like, restaurant problems, like, whoa, fight of your life, like, geez, this is what you're going to put your life into? Like, all right. Let's, right. Yeah. So, right. so what happened? So we called a meeting with the whole group. We call like the next week we have them into our space and, you know, I'm doing the talking before I stand up before I can even speak, you know, and explain what we're trying to do. Um, this one neighbor stands up and just lights me up. You know, we don't need you here. We don't want you here. You're a liar. You're not bringing a family style pizzeria. You're bringing a rowdy sports bar. You're going to destroy our neighborhood. What this guy said, right? You're going to create trash and drunken debauchery, and we aren't letting it happen. 
And I'm sitting here trying to reinvent myself, reinvent my career. I live in a new state where I don't know anybody. Okay. And I'm bro, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, you know, so what long story short, you have to get petition signatures in Denver. Um, you have to get a petition of support to get a liquor license. It's part of your evidence. Okay. I went, so I hired a company to do that. So unlike in Illinois, or I don't know about other states, but here where you just go to a liquor commission, they have you go out and literally get petitions from the general public. Yep. Just like you were getting on a ballot. So you get petitions. Exactly right. Hi, my name is Giles Flanagan. I'm opening up a restaurant. I'm going to need a liquor license. Can I get your support for that liquor license? Exactly okay. right. <clears throat> and they set boundaries. I mean, the government sets a boundary. It's arbitrary, but you know, so. In a way, I kind I, of like that. I mean, I hate the whole concept of liquor licenses as like a crazy taxation scheme, but from the sense of if you're going to do it, I'd rather put it in the public's hands than some bureaucrat prick or prick I wouldn't ass. disagree. Yeah. I wouldn't that's disagree. a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Now you're out knocking on doors and shit. I mean, so, you know, you hire in, in Denver, you hire a professional um, petition company to do this for okay. you because they admitted as evidence in the hearing and they got to sign off that they followed a certain rules and procedures and that they're licensed and all this shit, right? Well, as the owner of the business, you can get petition signatures also. I went door to door for five days straight. I probably knocked on in the neighborhood of, you know, three to 400 homes. And I introduced myself. I started with the people right next to the restaurant and went down block by block by block by block. Um, the hearing was so big that usually in Denver, you have a hearing in this little tiny room at the city building. There's maybe... 20 seats, okay? And they, they, five people show up, 10 people show up. It's not this big ish, not this big thing. Well, it's so we weird, had so- man, because it's not like this is like a strip club or a gun range or something right. like that. It's crazy. Right, right. You know, at that, it wasn't marijuana back then, which still has its stigma here. You know, you know the funny thing, what you just said is the property, so the property was zoned for a restaurant use. We weren't asking for a change in any in any zoning or any regulations. Um, but you could also, you could have uh, uh, um, an adult bookstore there. You could have, it was, I believe, marijuana at that time was a, a viable use under the current zoning. So there were some alternative businesses that were that could have gone there, right, with much less public involvement, mm. okay? <clears throat> um, so it was so big that we had to have it at 6 p.m. at night. They, and we had to have it in the atrium of the city building, okay? About 350 people showed up. Wow. The news, the news was there. Um, the, all the press was there. I mean, that's how much press this thing garnered because I went to the press nicely and said, look, we're trying to do something really cool. Um, and I, I didn't do it. In, you know, I wasn't doing it in a really negative way. What I was trying to do was explain to the public what we were trying to do, mm -hmm. right? I wasn't just going and, yeah, you know, saying these people are being jerks and they're making shit up. I was trying to use this opportunity to explain what we were doing and address their concerns. I get it. A new business is coming into your neighborhood and you're concerned. I respect it, but give me a chance to at least explain. And I, and I, and that was what I was having. I, they wouldn't let me explain, right? It was just, we don't want you. We're going to kill you. Um, so we had a hearing. Um, we, at that time, we actually, we got the most petition signatures in favor of a liquor license in the history of Denver. Okay. The most in favor ever. Um, and the liquor license off hearing officer, you know, took the evidence. Two weeks later, he denies us a liquor license, saying that we did not need that we did not need the need and desire clause of the law, um, and that uh, you know we would have a negative impact on the neighborhood because of parking, even though we had no parking requirement. Right? This is all arbitrary. You know, some of it might be relevant, but this is all you know ancillary arguments. Um, and those guys went back to tell you right, and I was left here. And that's when I started packing up to move back to my parents. <clears throat> and uh, so and, and the the whole deal, were you able to get out of the lease? Lease had a liquor license contingency. Okay. Very important in restaurant if you need liquor. Very important. 
yeah, I mean, you know, and I didn't have any money. So my business partners at that time put up all the equity, you know, they lost, you know, I lost over a hundred thousand dollars and that's a lot of money today, man. But back then it's even, it was even more money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were 35 years old, 36 years old. And, uh, you know, um, none of us were wealthy. Those guys were very successful, but none of us had, you know, family money or it wasn't mommy and daddy writing us a check and saying, you know, pay us back if you can. Um, they saved for four years and they lost it all. I lost all. And they went back to tell you, right. And retooled their business and they're doing really well today. But unfortunately I wasn't a part of that business. So I was essentially, um, told, Hey man, you know, you're more than welcome to come down here and work from time to time, but we really don't have anything to offer you. We're not going to do another location. We're out of money. You're on your own. Just wasn't, and worth, that, it wasn't worth any more investment. So what did you yep. do? How did you, so you pivoted from taking on a partner with an existing business to creating your own. Yep. 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 And so, um, I started so applying this, for this jobs. Whole time you're sleeping on your buddy's floor still. Yes. Yes. It sucked. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, yes. And, uh, you know, I started to think, you know, at this time, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time had moved out here. Right. And now I got to tell her whole family, like, you know, they knew my, my hardships with real estate that, yeah, I, I moved out here. I brought your, your, I brought my father-in-law's daughter out here, but I wasn't smart enough to do due diligence and make sure that, the company had all the rig, all, all the right licenses, right? I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But he's just like, why would you upend yourself if you knew that you needed these types of approvals? And I said, I didn't. I didn't do the due diligence. I got excited. I wanted to do this badly, and I, I wanted hate to live in when Denver. People ask questions like that because no matter what you say, it doesn't matter. You you you're, you are where you are. I just yep. had a conversation with a family member yesterday and I started to do that. And it was like, why am I going to do that? Like, it's only going to show that like, I'm superior and intellectually in this situation. Like it's, you can't go back and fix it. Like here we are. I mean, maybe, Hey son, in, in this situation in the future, could you do some better due diligence before you move my freaking daughter across the country? Yes. Right. Sir, that's, right. That's a right. I'm not gonna right. be ber berating your father-in-law. I'm just thinking. No, no, no. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was. It was more of an honest question. Just you know, <clears throat> tell you know. I mean, he wasn't mad. He's he's one of the best guys I know. He's a, he's an entrepreneur and self-employed too. He started a business out of his garage, so he gets it. Yeah, he totally gets it. But still, it was scary. You know, it was it was it was a scary time, man. And uh, then I started. So I'm applying for jobs, and I'm doing side work for buddies. I'm I was literally cleaning people's garages right for 15 dollars an hour um so here i am this you know former real estate guy i had the bmw i had my own house that i saved up my money for and bought it you know and uh you know i had you know I, i'm not a material possession guy mick i don't have a rolex you know i love cars like now, you wait know, a second. I, I was about to say that car of yours that i saw the last time i saw you is pretty pretty awesome that's my weak point if there is one right um i love cars it's my it, you know but i wear the same shirt every day i have four pairs of jeans i shop at discount stores you know what i mean man um sure. you know some of those lessons from that time have stuck with me to this day uh so i was, I was cleaning out people's garages and planting trees and shit, and it was really really humbling and it, had, it didn't have a great impact on my mental state at that time really, you know you get depressed you get sad you don't think you can do it um and i started applying for jobs and luckily i got a job um at uh the denver urban renewal authority and that's the tax increment financing uh entity in the city of denver that handles all the tiff it's called tax increment financing you're probably familiar with that in mm -hmm. chicago um, and it was a really big job, actually. I um, fought some tiffs. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very political. Mm -hmm. Very political. And so I get this job running the whole organization. Never had experience in tax increment financing. You know, my political experience was basically non-existent, right? Um, and uh, after about six months, my boss there, you know, just did not like me, man. 
Um, just what is with like this me. pattern of people you work with not liking you? I don't know. I think, you know, um, you know, <laughs> I really don't, you know, I mean, I can be a chipper guy, right. Um, you know, but, uh, I don't consider myself a negative, overly negative person mean, um, you know, but, uh, yeah, she just, I just don't think I was a good fit, um, okay. candidly for the job. <clears throat> so, um, I got a job at the city of Denver doing real estate and, um, I was in the real estate division there. And while I was there, I started Blue Pam. And that's kind of where we are today. And uh, so when I started Blue Pam, my partner, Mick, um, we didn't have any money, so we couldn't pay my salary. So for 14 months, I worked at the city and my restaurant. So I'd leave at 6.30 in the morning, I'd get to the restaurant, return emails, get my receipts organized and blah, 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 fly down to Denver, get up to my little cubicle, do my work there, right? Rush 4.45, rush to my car, rush back to the restaurant, work till 10 o'clock and come home. And that's basically what I did for 14 months with a nine month so old. So you're sleeping four, five hours tops a night. Yep, yep. And then we had a nine month old at that time, right? So our first child, my wife is working full time, you know, and without the support of my wife, it, would, it just would never have happened, um, you know? And we finally got to the point, man, where we build up some, Re, uh, reserves and revenue, and I was able after um, after fourteen months to leave my job at the city and concentrate in Blue Pan full time. How did you uh, find the partner that you work with? <laughs> You're gonna, here we go. Uh, childhood friend. We've known each other since kindergarten. Um, so he like, was. When at, times get tough. Do you go find your uh, your uh, uh, high school yearbook and start thumbing it through or? No, I'm not that. I'm not like a nostalgia guy, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I know you are. I know you are. Um, you know, but him and I are very different in good ways. He was an athlete. He was a football player. He walked on the University of Michigan football team. Oh, wow. Walked on and earned a full ride scholarship, which wow. if you know anything about Michigan football, it's very difficult to walk on and make the team. I want to have this team. guy on the podcast. Yeah, he's uh, – just a great human being, man. Great human being. Um, walked on. He was in Tom Brady's class, okay? So he was a freshman with Tom Brady and Charles Woodson, you might know of. And, you know, they were all in the fre their freshman class together. So they have a bond, right? When you're a freshman on a football team, I mean, that's some hard shit. Uh, so he walked on, earned a full ride scholarship. So, you know, I'm going, you know, this is during college, obviously. So I'm in out west, you know, my hair's long, I'm a little, you know, kind of a hippie and he's this clean cut athlete that's, you know, working his ass off to make, to be on the team, third, fourth string guy. Right. You know, and while he was playing, man, like, you know, it, it's brutal. I mean, they would say to him like, why are you, you're never going to start. Why are you here? Quit. Get the, you know, get the, you mean, you're wasting your time smoke. You're never going to start. What quit. You need to quit. And he never did obviously. And that's, you know, his, his, his mentality, his work ethic, obviously, was a big part of how he earned a full ride. Um, I think I don't don't quote me on this, but I think only two, maybe three walk-ons get a full ride uh, a year. So it's very, very hard to do. Um, you know. So and then, I, like I said, we reconnected and tell you ride. Tried the brown dog thing, didn't work out. So then him and I, uh, his partner, tell you ride after the brown dog Denver failed, just didn't want to come back to Denver. And uh, so Smoke, his name is Jeff Smokovich. He goes by Smoke. Him and I came up with Blue Pan. He's on so the he, food side. I'm on the business side. Okay. So he was from the other pizzeria. He's a very highly accomplished pizzaiolo. Um, he's won several national and international competitions. Um, when he went to Italy, so there's a, 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 a competition in Parma, Italy, that's arguably the most prestigious competition in the world arguably i'm not saying it is you could argue it it's very prestigious and his first time competing there he brought a detroit style and he got laughed off i mean these italians literally laughed at him you know what you know because it's all wood burning right it's mm -hmm. all it's all it's all neapolitan double zero flour mozzarella sauce basil that's it um and they laughed at him you know what the hell is this square thing with this caramelized what do you what is this um, I, one or two years later, he ended up winning, um, winning, um, 
the trifecta competition there for three different pizza styles, which is really hard to do. And that was a big moment for him and our business. Um, so, you know, I'm privileged to work with him. Um, he is on the food side, very creative chef driven um, person. And I'm on the operations, uh, finance, real estate, uh, day-to-day operations side. So again, coming back to that complementary skill set, very important when you're going into business with somebody, you complement each other. You're not in the kitchen telling him he's he's mixing the sauce wrong and he's not in no. the office telling you you're doing the books wrong. Yep, yep, exactly right. And we have a astoundingly great relationship. We very much rely on each other for support and uh, and 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 you know to make the business successful. And I just got I, I consider myself lucky that he essentially chose me because he could have chosen anybody. Two locations now. We have two locations now. Mm-hmm. Pardon, pardon me one second. Two locations. We're trying to grow. Um, we actually have a food truck that we're building right now that we're going to launch uh, in late February, early March. Very cool. Um, yeah, what's cool about, you know, so, you know, uh, or maybe you don't know, you know, people are judgmental, right? It's just how it is, you know? Um, and you'd be- know that. Yeah, yeah. And you'd be surprised um, how many people, not, not my family, um, people out there in the world, food truck, isn't that a step back for you? Like, what the- no, it's not a step back, uh, you know, because the implication there is like, you know, we're too good for a food truck. And food truck. Could- I think I think a lot of people that are not into the trendy food scene think of a food truck as like the trash food that would show up on job sites. Uh, exactly you know, every right. Day, every day at lunch, a cup of coffee, a freaking crappy Danish in a cellophane wrapper, the hot dog wrapped in foil shit. And they just automatically think of that. There's a yep. place in uh, New Orleans that um, I visited. A guy bought a city block, lined the perimeter of it with um, connexes, and you kind of like walk into this city block with connexes that all kind of face out to the street. And from mm-hmm. the outside, you're just looking at connexes. On the inside, it's this beautiful courtyard with uh, nice trees and, and shit, and there's a big deck in the wow. middle. And then they have live music, and each of those connexes has an awning that opens and food truck purveyors come in there and they rent the space. And then one of them, the owner has is the bar. So he's got okay. the liquor license and there's one of them is restrooms. So it's just like you take your kids in there or wh- whoever, and like you're off the street and it's this like cool, safe space where you can go get kebabs or a burger or, you know, whatever the food truck purveyors have. It's super cool. I love that shit. Where yeah. Just I, I love Rica, it. There's a whole, area of the beach full of them i love it i love it and you know out here mick some of the best food in the entire denver metro area comes out of food trucks i believe it i believe Um, some of the most authentic food some of the most you know authentic and unique food comes out of food trucks here are you going to do pizza on it or something different no, uh, so we're going to do pizza, but we're also going to do soft serve ice cream. So there's a particular type of custard that we, my, my business partner and I grew up on back in Birmingham, Michigan, Troy, Michigan. Um, so we're going to add a little custard. Um, so we're going to do that. Custard. What, what, what is this? I mean, like I'm, I'm a fan of good ice cream. Is this, this is not like some DQ shit in a bag. No, 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 no. Um, Cannily, I he's leading the charge in the custard aspect of it. Again, he's on the food side. Um, so I'm not really sure about all the details. Um, but it is we make it in-house and it's not we don't take powder and milk and you know. Okay. Um, but it's very creamy. It has higher fat than ice cream, mm-hmm. right? And you know, we'll have little toppings and stuff, right? So it'll be a new a new twist for us in an and in addition to our brand. And then on the pizza side, at our current pizzerias, we do we're known for our Detroit. It's about 90% of our pizza sales. And then we also do a Chicago cracker, a New York, and a gluten-free. And the food truck, we're only going to do Detroit-style pizza, um, smaller menu. And be able to bring it to concerts and people's birthday parties and neighborhood events and breweries. And we'll be able to test out some markets without having to make a you know, multi-hundred thousand dollar investment in leasing a space. Um, mm-hmm. So we're really excited about it. Um, and then we're trying. Please. 
You. We're trying to find a third location. It's tough, man. You know, yeah, we had a. Say, you're trying. To, I don't. That's what I was going to ask. I thought you were trying to find another spot. What, is it tough because Denver's just exploded? We were very picky about real estate. Mm-hmm. Very picky, almost to a fault. But in my opinion, real estate is so key when you're doing a restaurant. In my it'd opinion, be, it'd be so cool to see you attached to a brewery. That would be cool. Wouldn't you know, be? so. Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> we, we're we're already doing our inaugural event at a, at one of the best breweries here in Denver called Ratio. Um, oh, cool. I'm good. I'm good friends with the owner, and the minute he found about the food truck, he just said, "Hey, man, I want you. Um, what do we got to do?" And I said, "Can we do a, when we when we launch it? Can we do our first service at your place?" Um, so we'll definitely be be tapping into those markets. But you know, last year, Mick, we had a letter of intent signed for our third location in a great neighborhood. Uh, just outside of Denver, um, great neighborhood, and the landlord, uh, very, very big, well-known developer, very successful. And um, I kept on asking for a schedule and a schedule and a schedule. Long story short, we got a call in November, and after five months of going back and forth, uh, we were just told, "Hey, we're not going to do the project anymore. Good luck." So we wasted all this time. What um, didn't cost us a lot of money. Um, but what it did cost us was opportunities, opportunity cost, right? We are self-financed. We don't have investors. So people were bringing me deals last summer and fall. And I'm saying, no, Mick, you know, we we're already committed. Our capital's committed. We're under design. Um, so I passed on like two deals in particular that were just great locations, but, um, for whatever reason, he wasn't able to build the building and it was real disappointing, but, uh, we're back in the market trying to find something. So you're like rated the number one pizza business in Denver, right? Um, I, I guess it depends. Uh, so one thing we don't do, Mick, and we never do, is we never ever tell the public we're the best. We never tell the, I never go around well, Denver. So if you saying start I'm the best. searching online, all you see is number one pizza spot in Denver, number one pizza spot yep. in Colorado. I think I've even read articles from like internet or not international, but nationwide writers calling you the best pizza spot in America. I've read a few of those too, which is pretty freaking cool. We've got, we've made a lot of best of lists, right? And a lot of them, again, not only uh, in Denver, but nationally, um, but you'll never hear me going around telling people we're the best. We won't even use, we won't even use, uh, when we do our Instagram posts, Mick, I won't even let our social media guy use best, the best pizza ha- hashtag. I just, I, that's part of our culture is we, we don't consider ourselves the best. We work every day to get better. And again, people think it's cliche, but it's, it's at the core of our business and the core of our values of that run blue pan is every day is a new day to get better. Um, but we've made a lot of lists and the pizza scene here has exploded. Um, there are a boatload of really good pizzerias here, Mick. Pete, guys and girls just like me who love it, who are dedicating in big amounts of energy and time mm-hmm. and putting out great products, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but what, what uh, do you I think guess is making you so successful versus because that's a crazy business it's kind of like in construction like i want to be a painter like oh good luck with that there's only eight thousand more guys just like you what do you think is making you guys have this measure of success that you've had these years so when when you opened the podcast you mentioned the word saturated you know uh when you were just briefly introducing me and it is the restaurant and pizza in particular mick are so saturated out here um and uh that's for all sorts of reasons again great people doing great things in the food world um but it's really hard to it's really hard to kind of put yourself uh create a niche for yourself create a brand and kind of set yourself apart Mm. right um we're not a steakhouse obviously right um there's a steakhouse here in town arguably the best restaurant in Denver called Garden Grace. I go there once a year for my anniversary, right? It's expensive. It's good. It's a special place to go for a special event. Well, in the pizza world, Nick, I need you to come back every week, ideally. Mm-hmm. Every other week, right? It's, it's really built on repeat business, man. It's really those relationships that you brought up at the beginning with your customers that 
you really need to survive in the pizza business. I think the main thing that has resulted in our success is our staff, um, is our team. Now, the pizza will bring you in, okay? When we opened, nobody was doing Detroit style in Denver, okay? Nobody was doing it, number one. And number two, we were the most f expensive pizzeria, right? You probably so, still are, right? It's very expensive, but it's, you have super high quality ingredients too. That's flipped. There are pizzerias now that are doing Detroit style out here that are more expensive than us now, bro. Interesting. It's, yeah, that's exactly, yeah, it, it's, it's diff yeah, we were the most expensive. And I'll never forget, it was like the third or fourth week we were in business. It was a Saturday morning and I was sweeping the step, the stoop, right? Um, getting ready to open for lunch. And this kid drives by in a forerunner and yells out the window, you're way too expensive and starts laughing. And of course, keep driving, right? And this is actually mentioned in an article that I was recently um, interviewed for in Denver about the pizza scene. And my heart just sank, right? I'm just like, you know, nobody knows what this Detroit style thing is. And we're super, we're charging a premium, right? Um, and so the food will bring you in, Nick, but it's really the customer experience that brings you back. And we are hell bent on providing the best customer service possible. Um, it is it is everything to us. If we make a mistake, Mick, we own it. Even if we didn't make a mistake, if you didn't have a good experience, if you perceive that you weren't, you know, we didn't give you the best product possible, we we don't want your money. We just want another chance. We just want you to come back one more time and give us a chance. Our staff is insane. We have we have one of the lowest. We, want, we have one of the highest employee retention for a restaurant in the city, I would argue the city of Denver. Pre-COVID, our year-over-year -year retention was approximately 83%, meaning every wow. year, about 80% of our staff was, were retained. Uh, industry standard is 20, so we literally flipped it. And I'm really big on the 80-20 rule. I don't know if you've heard about that just oh, in, yeah. in life, but I'm really big on that. Um, so I, our, our staff, Mick, I mean, they work their tails off. They are prideful in what they do. And what we're doing is hard, okay? It's hard. We are so busy all the time. There's a lot of demand, a lot of pressure, and our product is not easy to make, man. I mean, we don't take a piece of dough and with a, with a machine to press the dough and then put sauce and cheese and put it in a conveyor that's set at 13 and a half minutes. So every pizza that comes out is, you know, cooked the same amount of time, right? You know, we have to work our ovens. We have to rotate food and make sure that the ovens aren't too hot or too cold. And different ovens have different temperatures for the different styles of dough. It's hard, but our staff is just remarkable. That's and, awesome. and, you know, some people think that, you know, I say that, because I'm pumping air, but it's, 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 they're everything to me, man. They, they support me. They support my family. They support the business. They support themselves. And at the end of the day, we're, we are in neighborhoods, Mick. We're not in downtown. I'm not on like a free, like a 55 mile an hour freeway or something. We are in these little neighborhoods. Our neighbors are homes, businesses and homes. And at the end of the day, um, I believe our staff does a remarkable job of supporting the neighborhood and bring something special. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been to, I, th I think I've been to both of your locations. I know yep. I, we, I think we were at both, yeah, definitely in neighborhoods. How do you take things like um, negative criticism from customers, like the guy riding by? I take stuff like that. I get that all the time for our gun lube business. The shit's overpriced, the shit's not needed. And you, I'm not gonna sell everybody. Uh, not, some people are happy with, uh, like I've got a pickup truck with heated and cooled seats that massage my ass. I just had somebody the other day tell me, all you need is a bench seat. And a freaking you know FM stereo. And it's like cool. That's what you need. But mine goes right. cold cold air up my ass. So right, right. And so does mine. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, I love exactly. it. Man. I mean, I work really hard for what I have, and I love that feature. Um, I've had to learn how to deal with that. It's not it. I didn't know how to deal with that, to be honest with you, at first, Nick. Um, I'll never forget the first one star Yelp review we got. I was, it was one of the few days off I had 
right? After opening the business, I was in my basement just trying to get some rest. It was an afternoon, maybe a weekend afternoon. Um, and we get a one-star review about our meatballs. Our meatballs suck. You know, it wasn't even about pizza. And I'm never coming back to this place. The meatballs suck. The service sucks. I, I get in my car. I speed down there, right? Um, my heart's pumping. I get behind the bar and I start serving food and my, you know, my staff could tell I was a little, I was a little revved up. And what I ended up doing in that moment, Mick, was actually projecting a lot of negative energy on my staff. I came in in a bad mood. I let this person make me really upset. And, um, you know, you bring that energy with you. I really mm -hmm. believe. So I, I, I believe what I, I made a choice to react in a really negative way and bring that energy and that attitude right to my staff, which was the absolute wrong thing to do. Um, so I learned a lot from that one incident. How do I deal with it now? It's very hard. Um, you know, it comes with the business first off, right? <clears throat> Some of our managers won't even go to Yelp. They, they work so hard to build our brand and provide a guest experience. They work so hard, man, but they won't check Yelp because they're too, they just they don't want, they just don't want to open up that door to a lot yep. of anger or negativity. Yeah. I mean, they put a lot of work into blue pan to make it what it is. Right. I call blue pan the kid, right? Blue pan comes first. The kid comes first, right? The staff, and the guests come first. And if there's anything left over at the end of the day, my partner and I split it, right? I mean, we, the pyramid is upside down. Blue Pan staff customers are all come first. Um, so how do I deal with it now? You know, I don't respond to negative reviews on these platforms. I'm getting a lot of pressure actually from people both in and outside of my company that I need to start responding to reviews that ups your Google ranking and all this shit, right? Um, I, I actually, I try to find out what happened, right? I try to, and then we try to get better. So we try to use negative feedback to get better at what we do. No bullshit. What did we do wrong and how can we make sure it doesn't happen again? So when we, when a guest has a bad experience, Mick, the way in my managers have been with me for over half a decade, right? They're going on six years. Both my lead guys at both locations have been with me for over six years, started out at 12 bucks an hour, right? Now they're, now they both bought homes. They're part of my life and uh, I, I can't do it without them. Um, so now we use it as a learning experience, to be honest with you. And we also use it, um, you know, to hold ourselves accountable. We will make mistakes. It's going to happen. And there are sure. days where we make a lot of them. Um, I think where I get frustrated, Mick, Mick is what, right when people go online and rip us apart. Because if they just email us or call us, they would find out that we would roll out the carpet, even mm -hmm. if we did do it anything. So like sometimes, <laughs> Mick, you know. I've, ha I've had this before. I had a customer that never even um, got the product that they ordered. They didn't get the product, not because we screwed it up, not because post office screwed up not because of anything their credit card was declined and Your they fault. went and wrote this bad review F us i needed this stuff i tried to order it their website's broken blah 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 i go look this guy up in our system and i can see okay he tried to place an order the credit card was declined we never see that stuff unless i go dig it out of the backside of the website so i call the guy and i'm like hey uh mr flanagan i See, you wrote this review online i said that's not why i'm calling you i just want to make sure you understand you never actually placed an order and he's like what are you talking about well of course he knows his card was declined because yep. he yep. would have never <clears throat> gone through but he was just rather so i sent the guy a case of shit for free i said hey you know you needed the lube i sent you some even i sent it to him before i even called him whatever cost me 25 bucks or whatever you know to send him the shit and i would rather do that and leave that guy with that memory than anything else and people tell me i'm nuts when i do that i go like that's that that's the guy i would rather go out of my way for not that i wouldn't go out of my way for an unhappy customer but the unhappy customer doesn't require it right right and i mean and that action on your part in my opinion humble opinion is a huge part of doing business um how you respond to people that are pissed, especially when they're wrong, can 
can partially define how you run your business. Um, you know, we have different crust styles, right? So people will go online and they'll, you know, Detroit style pizzas in our logo. Okay. When you go online, we have all these pictures and shit, right? And you click on the picture that says Detroit style. Okay. Well, for whatever reason, people sometimes they'll click on Chicago, right? Big picture, thin pizza. They'll click on that. They come in and they get upset. I ordered, you, you got this wrong. I ordered the Detroit style. What the you know, they get, you know, some people get really upset and we just say, Hey Mick, you know, really sorry. Um, can you give us about 15 minutes? We'll be happy to make you a Detroit style pizza on the house. Right. Um, it's not that big of a, and people think that shit's nuts. Like people think that if I, if I comp an order or send somebody a gift card, um, and you know, the, it, especially to people that are quote unquote in the wrong, that I'm doing a disservice to the business myself and I need to take a stand. And so I respond to these situations. Um, when it gets really nasty, Mick, I don't respond. If it gets personal, we won't let you back in. So we've had people call, uh, you know, my team members really vulgar names, um, very vulgar stuff. And we mark them in the computer and we will not serve them again. Um, I like but, that. Uh, yeah, when it gets personal, it's done um, because my staff takes enough heat. And when you start calling people and pieces of shit, um, you're done. Like, I'm sorry you're having a bad day, but we, you, I don't want your money anymore. And I definitely don't want your energy in our business ever. Um, so we, take, we try to learn from them first off. We try to correct them by reaching out to the customer, right? And, you know, again, all we ask is, you know, would you please give us another chance? And I would say 80, 90% of the time, we earn a customer for life, right? We don't advertise, Nick. My advertising budget is zero, okay? Besides so our social the, media. That's the funny thing. Like when people are giving you advice about how to deal with the reviews on Google or Yelp or TripAdvisor or whatever, and then, because people will do this to me, do you, I give away all this free content on our YouTube channel, which is videos from our training. And they go, you're, you're just giving that shit away. So I've never paid to advertise one class and we fill every class though. Like you gotta, like, right. so, so they're telling you how to do this. And every time that I've ever been to one of your restaurants, you've got lines of people. So it's not like you're out there with a freaking the board over to the front of your shirt, walking around right. saying half off Saturdays or whatever. You got, right. Yeah. And that goes back to the reputational part of our discussion, right? Um, we don't advertise. We are word of mouth, man. And when we get, when we um, are fortunate enough to be recognized by the media, that puts our name out there big time also. Um, but man, I need, I need our guests to have a great experience. Because like, you know, man, somebody has a bad experience. They'll probably tell 10 people how much you suck. People mm -hmm. have a good experience. You're lucky if they tell one person, right? But, you know, we've been open for almost seven years now. You, maybe you wouldn't, but you'd be shocked how many people come in almost daily and bring somebody new with them because they had a great time at Blue Pan and they want to introduce it to somebody else, you know, and, I have, and I that's have reputation. restaurants like that, that I, I somebody comes to visit, we're going to go to one of those two or three places, depending on their food taste. If somebody doesn't like pizza, I'm not bringing them to a pizza joint or if somebody doesn't like steak. I'm not taking them to the steakhouse, but yeah, for sure. That's right. right. That's cool. I mean, I don't want to flip it, but you know, how do you deal with it? I mean, you have a huge social media presence. I mean, when, when we were hanging out at new terrain brewing, the last time you were here, I mean, the guy a came brewery. up, a great brewery a guy came up to you and said hey you're the terry trainer guy i mean you're out in the middle of golden colorado and somebody recognized you by your by your name and your brand um and some of your topics you know they they can tend to um you know create a, an emotional response i mean how do you deal with it um if you don't mind me asking hmm, i mean i guess do you I'm respond not, do you not respond i try to but it's not so much that i want to argue or make the person feel wrong because i could be wrong I and mean, i i can be very uh crass um i don't i'm not the kind of person that likes to spend extra words to communicate something 
And to some people, that sounds uh, arrogant or uh, condescending, and that's never my intention. But if I sound so like that, I need to work on that because I'm not uh, intending to be condescending or or crass. For example, um, a child recently, <clears throat> two days ago, I think it was in Michigan, actually. Uh, two and a half year old kid grabs mom's gun out of the console, I saw that. pulls the trigger, shoots sibling round also saw that. shoots mom. Yeah. So I was, I think it was in Denver area or I'm sorry, uh, Detroit area. Wasn't it? Very sad. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I share that. And then, you know, I wrote some shit about like responsibility of gun owners, blah, blah, blah. Well, I shared the news clip where the, I think the newscaster used the word, um, a child accessed a secured or gun that was secured in the console. So this viewer fixated on the newscaster saying secured. And I wrote in the post, uh, the child accessed an unsecured gun. And they're like, well, what is it? Like, was it secured or wasn't secured? And was, first of all, this same person probably would be the kind of person that says everything that the media says is a lie. But in this instance, they're going to go ahead and agree with it because it bolsters their point. And they said, well, it was, there you go. It was, in the, yeah, it was in the console. I said, but dude, it, it, and I didn't want to argue with them other than explain the point because it's his kid's safety. I said, it wasn't secured. Like if the kid got access to it, it wasn't secured. And so that's like the proof's in the pudding. If it was to secure something means to make it secure. Like a gun safe is not a cardboard box, right? It's right. a it's a thing that's metal and it's got locks and all these, these right. things to stop. So when something is like that, I will do my best. But if it's just somebody, for example, our gun lube, guys get so men in general, man. I guess like food, they, because we get emotionally attached, people will write me like hate mail. You dumb you're trying to like pedal uh, some uh, uh, pie in the sky moon juice right. that's just some junk. Actually, it's a made in the USA quality synthetic lubricant that is similar to what's used by uh, aerospace and, and high performance uh, auto manufacturers, et cetera. And I don't waste a lot of energy with that because this person has a preconceived idea that I'm not going to spend an hour of a day to try to get one sale out of some guy. Like I just say, cool, man. Sounds like you have something that works for you. I would use that. Be well. Yep. What I do spend time on after every one of our training courses, and now I'm going to give everybody a little one of our secrets. I did this in construction, but if I ran a sales call, no matter what I would even, no matter if I ever saw the person again, I would call them. For years, I would send people a thank you card. Thank you for having me in your home. I appreciate that you gave me the opportunity to look at your bathroom or your deck or whatever. And I was serious. I mean, that meant a lot that you trusted me to come in your home and spend a yep. half of a day. You know how long that shit takes. Even if yep. it's something like a powder room, you could spend a week of your life to meet the person, source the materials, develop a proposal, go back and answer questions. It's a long commitment. And, Absolutely. So and they're our, investing money, you know, they're investing their saved money in something for their home. It's, there's yeah. an emotional attachment too. <clears throat> yeah. So even if they the didn't cost. hire me, I would send them a thank you. Yeah. So when it was our training, our training courses, uh, every one of our classes, I print a roster with people's name and well, Drew does it. Thank you, Drew. But he prints a nice roster with um, all the contact information for everybody. And on my way home, I'm usually driving. So I will call everybody and I say, Hey guys, it's Mick. Wanted to chat with you about class and uh, just want to tell you, thank you for being there. And if, if uh, you know, there was something that you wanted to talk about, something that we didn't talk about, something you didn't want to talk about in front of anybody else, you know, you got my ear. If not, this is my cell phone. Call me if you need me, you know, and usually it's just a nice, Hey, thanks for calling. Uh, but once in a while, yeah, man, there's something I want to talk about. I didn't like this. And I had a guy recently that I could tell just by the sound of his voice, the quiveriness in his voice, he was angry. It was like straight up anger. And I'm like, whoa, because okay. my last my last 
in person was a picture that we took with him smiling and laughing. And now like six hours later, I can hear, it was like a that where a man's trying to hold rage back. And I'm like, what's going on, man? I can hear you're upset. Mm -hmm. He, mm -hmm. I think he felt that uh, something we did in class was intended to embarrass him. And it wasn't at all. Like, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. And so it was a very hard discussion. A man that's older than me, been on earth longer than me, um, had some successes that I've not had in life, had some failures and in, in overcome those that I have not had in life. So he's a wise person. And he felt that I was trying to make fun of him to like elevate myself. And I said, I'm like, whoa, wait a second, man. I got, first of all, I got to go off the data. You're the only person that's ever told me this. So that's meaningful unless everybody else <clears throat> is afraid. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it was hard to talk about. And at the end of it, there was no resolution. It was an agree to disagree because after an hour on the phone, it was it. I said to him, if you felt that way, I'm sorry. I had no intention of making you feel that way. You got to be believe me. And if you don't, that's all I can say. But right. um, he wanted to win. He wanted to let me know I'm a. I did this thing to him and I said, I realize I can't. We're just going to keep bouncing the ping pong ball back and forth to who's right and who's wrong and i said you're entitled to that opinion but it was not my intention and i appreciate you and that's just the end of it and i gave him a full refund for class which is hundreds no of kidding and wow. I, he, he didn't want wow. it. he didn't want it but it's just like you in that pizza thing like i'll give you a free pizza if because even if the person ordered the wrong thing i, I don't want your money if you think i'm the kind of person that invites somebody out to do what is very serious to me and then just tries to make you look bad like i'm some that's a bully and that ain't me so i'm like i don't want your money and at the very least and maybe this is wrong i no matter what this guy says i can tell the world i gave the guy a full not that i i've never told this story right so it's not that i want to tell the world but I wash my hands of it. And that's not often, but I mean, if you so hate what you got, give me your money back, man. So I totally agree with you on that. But Same boat. Yeah. <laughs> I, think the, I think the big thing for me, and I've been there, man, where you get so fired up. I talk about this often with people. You could threaten to beat my ass and I wouldn't get an adrenaline response, not because I'm tough, and I want to fight with you. In fact, it's the opposite, but that wouldn't cause me to get an adrenaline dump. You could send me an email and say, I was in your class or I bought your product and it's garbage and I hate it. And I would have an immediate adrenaline response. I'd be like, damn, like yep. I worked so hard to make these people happy. Why not to make people happy, but to provide the a product in a meaningful way. Like what the, you know, wow, how did this happen? Yeah. Right, right. And it's hard to hear. It can yeah. be hard to hear. You know, um, personal attacks are far and few between, but we get them. You know, we yeah. had a lady, we had a lady that ordered delivery from us a couple of weeks ago and she was intoxicated, right? Um, so our driver, <laughs> our, you know, I mean, you, you just know, right? Um, so our driver goes to the address and is ringing the doorbell and calling her number and ringing the doorbell and no, blah, 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 no answer. So he leaves the pizza on the, on the porch and calls her again and say, hey, it's on the porch, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. Um, so then she calls the restaurant and she's cursing out my manager. Oh, wow. Um, and oh, no, no, let me, let me back up. So the driver calls the manager. So what does he do? He gets on his phone and sends her an email. Hey, we're, you know, we're trying to deliver the pizza, blah, you know, so we're, we, we are like doing our best to try to contact this, this lady. Um, we're not ignoring her. And she calls me, you know, just is reaming out my manager and, and, you know, he read back the phone number and she goes, oh, that was the wrong number. And she ordered online. I mean, we said, well, I'm really, ma'am, you gave us the wrong number. I'm sorry. Right. Where would we get the number? Yeah. You know, but she was vulgar. And um, so, you know, we ended up, uh, you know, agreeing to disagree. And then she sends my manager, you know, because you get a little automated email that says your order is on its way. She sends my manager and my manager see those. Like she responds, no, sorry. She responds to his email saying, we can't get a hold of you. It's <laughs> and all bull, you know? And it's just like, <laughs> now now we laugh at it, you know? Um, we, we, we really do. But it's just like, are you serious? Like, we, we did our best. 
he it's gave us such the wrong a big number. expense of energy. Funny thing, yep. then, now, however long ago that was, right now, she's still absorbing not only your energy, but nine, and now all the people listening and viewing to this, her f bullshit, drunk ass, bad attitude. Now, thousands of people are hearing, and you and I are still talking about it. It's right. funny. Right. Yeah, and energy is very contagious, man. In my that opinion, especially agree. in my business, man. Uh, we have upwards. We have about thirty-five to thirty-six hundred customers a week. Um, that's a lot of human interaction. Okay, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these people are coming home from work and they had a bad day. Mm -hmm. Some people are with their kids and the kids crying and they're not in a good mood. Um, energy is so contagious, man. And one of the things I really try to impart my staff and and some of them do, don't agree with it, some of them do, is when somebody gets rude with us, we have to identify it mentally, okay? Identify the situation, recognize it, and we get nicer. That's, that's We want to get nicer as somebody's getting ruder to try to rectify the situation. And what that does more often than not is we stay more calm, we don't let their negative energy get into our into our body because then we carry that to the next guest and the next guest and the next guest. I mean, it happens. You, you, mm -hmm. you, it, you'd be shocked. Um, and, um, uh, um, you know, again, again, as long as it doesn't get personal, uh, we try to get nicer if somebody gets ruder. And we do, as long like as it doesn't that. get personal, and we do whatever it takes to make it right, even if we're in the right. It's a cool, uh, like, mental set point where you just, you can work your script and it's not even a, in a, some senses, it's not even about the customer from a, like a maybe philosophical standpoint. It's like, how well can I stick to my plan? Like it's like a self-improvement thing versus. Absolutely. Ma'am, I'm sorry that you're having a bad day. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Which that's the, that's the easy, I mean, that's easy to do is when somebody is really rude to you and nasty, it's very easy to, for humans, get defensive, talk back, get in an argument, right? Um, that's the easy path. In my opinion, the harder path is staying calm and just trying to get honest in all seriousness, try to be nicer and nicer and nicer. So we, so we have a chance of that guest leaving either happy or at least leaving and giving us another chance, you know, mm -hmm. but it is very much a mental, it, it's very much, um, you know, you've got to be situationally aware of when these things happen. And I believe that you never really learn it all. You're always, when you get in a tough situation with a guest, you're constantly learning how to get better and be nicer. And it, it takes a lot of energy. Um, but man, it's really easy to get, let that person get you really upset and then Mick walks in the door, right? And now I'm in a bad mood and I'll mm -hmm. snip at you or just be short right. and rude with you. And I mean, we've done that, right? Um, but we work really hard uh, now and it's part of our company culture to, 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 not, to work really hard and not behave that way. I like it. We covered a lot of ground. We talked about, uh, of course, your history, your uh, trials, tribulations, where you're at now. What is something that you would leave with people uh, if they never saw you again, never visit your restaurant, if they live in Ireland or Timbuktu, if they never cross your path, what's something that if, if they thought of Giles Flanagan, that they could take away as something meaningful from the last 20 years of your living? Um, I've never been asked that question. I, um, you know, I would hope that most people would 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 believe that the people that choose to work for me um were taken care of and treated with respect um i'm very very mindful that the people that work at blue pan nick they make a choice to work at blue pan they can go anywhere else and work and they choose to spend their time that they'll never get back right in their energy to make this dream of mine a successful place so one thing I would hope that people would take away was that I always took care of my team and I put my team ahead of myself. And I would say also a second thing is humility. Um, humility is a big part of my life. Um, you know, you like Tyson said, you have a plan till you get socked in the mouth, right? I've been socked in the mouth, you know, both <laughs> literally and figuratively in my career many times. 
Um, and it's taught me to be a real humble person and really, really gr- appreciative of the great things that do happen. Um, so humility is a big part of my life. And in my business, man, you know, the ego is a big deal, right? I mean, there's, there are chefs in town, you know, they name their restaurants after themselves They're on television, you know, they're, they're a big deal in the food mm-hmm. world. And it's easy to get wrapped up in yourself and convince yourself that you're the shit. Um, this also goes back to why we never, we never tell the public we're the best in Denver, um, you know, humility. So taking care of my team and, and, and staying humble, um, I think are two things I hope people would take away um, if they interact with me or if they don't. I dig it. I appreciate you taking the time. We've actually talked about doing this a few times and finally finally made it happen. I'm glad we did. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so happy. I'm so happy you reached out. Um, I really, I gotta, really uh, appreciate I gotta it. I got to book a flight, come out and do some skiing. My nephew and I both want to hit the, <clears> hit the We're here hills. for you, bud. We we'll have to. fun and burn some steam. Yeah, you know, you, that's another thing is you got to take time off, bro. I'm real bad at that. So I haven't taken a week I'm off. Good since. at it. Yeah, I got to get better. Honestly, I haven't taken a full week off since February of 2013. I've taken five days off, maybe six, but I've never done a week. And this summer, That's my fam, yeah, it is. It's stupid, in my opinion, right? Um, so we're taking a week off this summer. We're going to go to Utah and Flagstaff, where I went to school, and uh, you know, have some fun, spend some time I together. Like it. I like it. You, you never get time back, and as far as I know, nobody's beaten death. So no. uh, you got to really, really... Uh, you got to be very mindful of how valuable it is. How do people find you? Um, our business? Mm-hmm. W- word of mouth. So I spend no money on SEO, search engine optimization. How do the people listening find you? So if they want to oh, come visit. Oh, pardon me. Pardon me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, there, there goes my, my business mind. Um, uh, BluePanDenver.com Blue is our Denver. website. Okay. BluePanDenver. Um you know, um, explains what we do, how we do it, explains the history of what we do. Um, it's a great website. Talk, explains a little bit about my partner and I and what we do and why we're passionate about the business. Um, but our website's a great place to start. And then you're on Instagram. We're on Instagram. Um, our social media coordinator is really, really good. He's just a great guy and very talented. Um, we post, you know, two to five times a week, depending on the three to five times a week. Um, great platform to see what we do, how we do it, and, and to kind of experience it. What's the the handle on Instagram? Is it Blue Pan it's Pizza? It's Blue Pan Pizza. Yep. Okay. Instagram, Twitter, uh, Blue Pan Pizza. Some guy, some guy bought BluePan.com and is holding it hostage. He wants to sell it to us for forty thousand um, dollars. So you know we don't have that website yet. We're working on it. Yeah, I've put yeah. no energy into it. No, I wouldn't. Fuck hey, it. for you you guys that listen uh, or viewed, I hope you dug it. It's a good conversation. Uh, every time I go to Denver, I make it a point to get some pizza, uh, visit. And I think that's something that is so special about food, too, is the camaraderie. Like the last time that we hooked up, you brought some. We sat out under the view of the mountains, had some delicious local beers, and that's like what's why I love food so much, not just the eating of it and the tasting of it, but the, the commiserating and the, the camaraderie and friendship that happens over the food. That's, that's a, such a great way to bond. So I'm, I'm really glad you bought that. I'm really glad you brought that up because pizza is one of those food, uh, one of those uh, dishes that you share, right? Mm-hmm. You usually share a pizza with a friend or whoever, right? Um, you and I aren't getting fillets and eating everything off <laughs> right. the plate. You, you know what I mean? For your bite. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, can I have a bite, sweetheart? Um, but the, the communal aspect of pizza, in all seriousness, is another reason why I love the business so much. I um, dig it. It's really, spe- in my opinion, special. And you guys have an, it, unlike some pizza joints where it's uh, an assembly line, you have an atmosphere. One of, uh, not, I was about to sign off, but one of my last memories of being in your, uh, one location was with our friend Mike Orlikoff before he passed away. Uh, yep. My brother-in-law's brother, who I've known since I was 17 years old, and we all sat around the table. I shared some pictures uh, from the from the pizza joint uh, from that meal, but it was nephews and uh, yep. uh, family, <clears throat> and, and we had a you know great a great time, uh, made a good memory, and that's 
that's cool. Like you don't, you don't do that at uh friggin' pizza hut. I mean, you can, yes, but it's not the right. same and it's right. And the food sucks there too. Right. <laughs> sorry, you know, and, sorry, and that's a big pizza part hut. of our business. That's a big part of our brand, Nick is just, uh, you know, making sure people have a great time when they choose to come see us. Cause they have a lot of choices. Yeah. Then that's, a, that's the part that I think is so important and why I wanted to ha- have this discussion and share some of this story. You guys that are business owners, tons of lessons here. Or if you are a want to be business owner, if you've got that entrepreneurial thread running through your DNA and you are wanting to start a business, what you just heard is a story that any successful entrepreneur that I've ever met would somehow relate to. Uh, Success, failure, success, failure, success, failure, and like a continual, I don't like the word grind so much, but like a continual uh, choice to make make it grow. So take that away. Be well. Don't be dickheads. Go check out Blue Pan Pizza. Tell somebody you love them. Appreciate you, Mick. Have a great day, brother. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com. Hey, little brother, what do you think of gunfighter gun oil? I'm going to have to show you. (sighs) Hey, Steve, what do you think of gunfighter gun oil? Well, Mick, uh... (laughs) Hey, Steve, what do you think of gunfighter gun oil? Well, Mick, I have to show you about that. Still working on it, but you. Oh, yeah. So you like the lube?